In this video, we're going to have a little fun with hashing. So, what is hashing? So, if you consider a binary search tree that has insertions, deletions, and finds, um, they run in various time complexities, but increasing. However, what we'd ideally like is an operation completed in a constant time. And we'd also love it to be independent of the size. So, a hash table is a way to do that. It's like a lookup function. Basically, you have a key that gets put into a hash function, which generates an index into a hash table where you get your value. Ideally, your hash function is simple. Your keys map one to one, and you're good. That doesn't happen all the time, so there are things we have to do, but back to the basics. What can't you do? Find min or find max? Nope. Can you print a hash table in a sorted order? Not without having to pull all the elements and sort it. It's not really made for that. So the ideal hash table structure is an array of items of a fixed size. Use a key for the lookup. The size of the hash table n runs from 0 to n minus 1. So it's a fixed array. Each key is mapped onto the array uh, 0 to n minus 1. The mapping is called a hash function. Ideally, this would be efficient to compute and would and must guarantee, ideally, any two different keys result in a different cell location. There's problems, though. Given a finite number of cells and an infinite number of keys, finding a hashing fun function h of x, which maps onto an array, can be very difficult. On an infinite number of keys, it's impossible without co collision. If the range r is finite, and the domain, and less than or equal to the size of the domain, then a minimal perfect hashing function can be created, but it only works if the data is essentially static. So you can create a perfect function, but your data can't grow or shrink. Your, your, your sets have to be finite and match it. Our best hash function distributes the keys as evenly as possible among the cells. So let's take an example. Don't worry about the hash function. Just understand the value of the name is converted to an array index. So the size of this hash table is 10. So the name John will hash to 3, Phil hashes to 4, David to 6, and Mary to 7. If our data is as simple as integers, then simply returning the key mod the table size is a reasonable first approach. This works because it automatically wraps around. So if n equals 10, hash x of n, hash of x, where x is x mod n, well, if x equals 25, the hash will be 25. We're guaranteed a number between 0 and n minus 1. However, this can cause problems. If we use that prior hash function, let n equals 10, h of 100 will equal 0, h of 20 equals 0, and h of 40 equals 0. And that's called a collision. One partial solution is to make the hash table size a prime number. This can help but it's no guarantee. If the input keys are random integers, the function is easy to compute and distributes the keys evenly. We don't always have integers. Strings and other data types are often used. How could we write a function h of s that takes a string and computes an index? One solution, whoops, this is a duplicate. Um, so we could use ASCII values to an index. So our hash function would take a string and our table size, and we'd set it to zero, and we'd add all the characters, and then mod it by the, ha by the hash table size. That is simple to implement and easy to compute, but does it give us a distribution? Um, not that great of one. It will tend to cause clumping. Another approach is we could take the first three characters, multiply them by some random number, and add them together. And if the key has at least three characters, we can use the 26 characters in the English alphabet. Our resultant hash value counts are 729. With a table of 10,007, we could expect a better distribution. Is this well distributed? Distributed? Well, the English language isn't that random. So even with no collisions, only about 28% of the table can be directly hashed into. So it's not perfect. Another approach we could multiply and add it to the previous value. Um, and we use all the characters. It's simple to compute. 
Um, and it's based on something called Horner's Rule, which is an algorithm for calculating polynomials, and demonstrates the complexity required to create a hash function that is both computationally cheap, easy to implement, and distributes much better. However, if the strings are long, hash 3 can be rather expensive. You do not always need to use all the characters, but the length of the string you choose to use will influence your choice of hashing functions. Based on your keys, you can potentially take advantage of unique properties of them to improve your hashing. Let's assume your string is a street address. What type of hash function could we derive? Well, the key could be a complete address with the hash function using a couple of the characters from the street address, a couple from a name, etc. Other approaches could only use the odd characters. Uh, the end result here is having a good hash function is important. If and when an element is inserted and it hashes to an index that is already in use, it's known as a collision. That is, if h of x1 equals h of x2 and x1 doesn't equal x2, we will have a collision. There are two common results for dealing with collisions. Open hashing and closed hashing. Open hashing is for each bucket where x equals h of k, create an unordered linked list of all elements that hash to the same value. The right elements are pointers to the first nodes of the list. A new item is inserted in the front of the list. Properties include performance will degrade with the length of the chain. So the more collisions you have, the worse your performance will be. So in this example, if we insert 1, 8, 12, 13, and 10 using mod x mod 7, we're going to get a list of 8's going to hash to 1, 1 will hash to 1, 10 will hash, 3 will hash to 10, 10, and so forth. So we will get some chains. Um, there are some problems. Memory is consumed by pointers. Not a big of a deal these days, but it also does take time to search linked lists. Now, in a closed address hashing system, all data are stored directly in a table. A bigger table can be needed. If a collision occurs, alternative cells are tried until an empty cell is found. Performance degrades with the difficulty in finding the right spot. So here, we'll use this approach. h of 1 equals 8, h of 10 equals 3. So h of 1 equals 8, h of 10 equals 3. h of 12 would be 5, so we're OK. Um, but h of 1 and, oh, I'm sorry, h of 1 and 8 collide. So what we got to do is find the next available spot, which would be h of 2. Similarly, uh, h of 10 uh, would uh, hash to here, and h of 3 would also hash to here, so we're going to have to find the next spot. Now, back to separate chaining. It keeps a list of all elements that hash to the same value. So again, let's run through an example. Assume the keys are the first 10 perfect squares. Keys are 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, etc. And if we use a hat function mod n, then the index looks like 0, 1, 4, 9, 6, 5, so forth. Okay. Uh, we then find the first available slots. I don't know why this is labeled hash training. Oh, so here it is. Doing the same thing, we'll get a list of, well, here, if we have the, any of the the duplicates, we will have to find the next available spot. So 1 and uh, 1 and 81 will hash to the same spot, so we'll have to find the next available slot. Similarly, with keeping a list in, a, in separate chaining, it looks like this, where wherever we have a conflict, we'll push them onto a list. So what's the basic algorithm? If x equals no, we'll create the linked list and add x to the list. If x doesn't equal no, we'll insert it into the list. How do we find it? We hash to x and then traverse the list until we find it or get no. To delete, we hash to x to get the bucket and then you remove it from the linked list. So there's pretty straightforward there. The other option would be using collision probing and that's with a closed table. In probing, we look for alternative cells until an empty cell is found. Given cells H0 through Hn, they are tried in successive in section where H of i equals x and 
it equals hash of x plus f of i, which is a secondary function, which is our collision resolution strategy. Um, when using programming, all elements go into the table, so the table is generally larger. Some of, whoops, some of the types of probing could be linear, quadratic, and double hashing. So, given an item, if we use f of i, or f of i squared is the quadratic, and then we could have a second hashing function, too. In linear probing, f is a linear function of i, so f of i equals i. Cells are tried sequentially with wraparound. So 889, 18, 49, 58, 69. Well, if we have a hash function with 10 of the table size, we put in 89, then 18. 49, we have a collision. Uh, so it would wrap around. 49, uh, 58, we'd have another collision. So it would have to find the next spot and so forth. Linear probing works while the table is large enough for a free cell to be found. Even for a relatively empty table, blocks of occupied cells begin to form. This is known as clustering. If a key hashes into a cluster, it would often require several attempts to resolve the collision. So this means time to find it could degrade. In quadratic probing, f is a quadratic function. Cells are tried sequentially. So here, 89, 18, 49 would look like we get this. 89, then we probe again and get 18. 49, they run up in 1 again, or 0 again. f of 1 equals 1, and f of 2 would be 4 here. So the next collision, our 58, would be end up here. And again, we'd see a different uh, result with hopefully a wider distribution. Double hashing introduces a second hash function, which means we apply a second hash function to x and then probe at a distance. And we could use 2 times x, hash 2, 3 times x, hash 2, and so forth. So hash of 2 of x equals x mod 9, for example. Um, f of i equals i times hash 2. If we build on our last example, uh, we insert 99, it would conflict with 89. Basically, hash 2 can never return 0, or you'll definitely have problems. It's important that all cells can be probed, not possibly example because the table's not prime. This can be achieved by designing a hash function that looks like r minus x mod r, where r is a prime number smaller than the size of the table. Okay. So here, using that example, we'll get 18. Hashes 49, we have a first conflict. We'll see it hashes to 7 on our second shot. We'll see, um, then we'll see 58. Uh, because that is collision, it will hash to 5 after applying that algorithm, and so forth. Rehashing. What do you do if the table is full? You build a new table that's twice as big with a new hash function. You scan the original table, computing a new key and then place the element in a new location based on the key. So when the table is 70% full, for example, we might not want to create a table twice as big. You don't want to go to 100% full because then you will end up with the potential of running out of table space. So now we're going to create a table that's twice as big, um, but we're going to find the first prime after 12 uh, because we'd always like to work with a prime. So then we're going to run through and repopulate our table using our hash. Load factor is the ratio of the number of elements in the hash table to the table size. In the ideal case, a load factor should be less than one. As the load factor approaches one, you might want to rehash. So here, the, local, the load factor is 0.71. Here, the load factor is one. Um, now, in STL, there is a hash table implementation of sets and maps. They are unordered set and unordered map. But since we're talking about how they work, we're not going to go into that. So now we'll go into a little demo.